Good morning. We're going to begin. Uh, the session today is to give you a preview of USDE's annual reporting for the ESSER grants. Uh, this is a kind of a consolidated report that will cover ESSER 1, ESSER 2, and ESSER 3. Uh, I'm going to briefly go through kind of an overview, cover a few slides for you about this federal reporting requirement. And then Natalie is going to go into the actual data collection reporting form in detail with you. And most of the training time will be spent going through the demo of what the system is expected to look like. So as with all of our trainings, this presentation is solely for general information. Uh, everything can change and Things on this federal report from USD have changed multiple times already, so it is subject to change. I'm not an attorney. If you need legal advice, you are required to seek legal counsel from your local LEA uh, guide, guidance from your local LEA legal counsel, and this training is not to be considered legal guidance. We're going to do this quick introduction. We'll talk about the timeline on the report. Uh, some definitions, and then uh, again, Natalie will give you a demonstration of the actual reporting form, and then we'll take some Q&A toward the end of the session. So submit all your questions in the Q&A function on Zoom. And obviously, we are most likely going to get a whole lot more questions than we're able to answer in the time period allotted today. So we will answer the questions that are voted up, meaning if you see a question and you want that question to be answered, you click on that sums up icon beside the question, that votes it up. The more people that click on that icon that want to see that question answered, that question moves to the top of the list. And so where we're answering the questions that are of most interest to you as the viewers. Again, there is no separate sign in this morning. Zoom tracks attendance and will send us a report uh, later in the day. So you don't need to enter your name and district number anywhere. Uh, we'll get it all from Zoom to know that you were here. The recording and the slides will be made available to you through the ESSER webpage and we will email you to notify you. But again, that is most likely not going to happen before Friday. So USDE started ESSER annual reporting last year. You'll remember there was an annual ESSER 1 report last year uh, that Natalie worked with you, your ESC staff worked with you on getting this data collection. They have expanded the annual reporting. It will now cover ESSER 1, ESSER 2, and ESSER 3. It's gonna look slightly different. And the reporting periods are just a little weird for you. But USD is requiring the reporting periods to be based on state fiscal year. So state fiscal year is September 1 through August 31. They are very specific in this year's report that it starts on October 1 of 2020, not the state fiscal year. So this will be an 11 month report in the first submission. And then so it will go October 1st of 2020 through the end of the state fiscal year, which is August 31st. So you've got another federal reporting requirement for ESSER that's looking at your data, and you're gonna to have to be cutting your data and reporting it again, a slightly different way. And so the time periods are specific. They are intentional on USDE's account, uh, but they do fall a little unusual for how you're used to reporting with your federal funds. So for ESSER 1, this will be your second annual report, and it's going to cover the time period of October 1st of 2020 through August 31st of 21. So this is basically the state fiscal year 21 report. Next year, you will have the third report of ESSER 1. It will be September 1 of 21 through August 31 of 22. And then the fourth annual report for ESSER 1 
will be September 1 of 23 through August 31 of uh, September 1, 22 through August 31 of 23. So this is the reporting for ESSER 1, but you're going to see the exact same schedule for ESSER 2, except it will be the first time you've done the annual report for ESSER 2 that will cover that same time period of September 1 of 20 through August 31 of 21. Then you'll have the same second annual period that matches and aligns to the fiscal year 22 dates as does ESSER 1. And you'll see that ESSER 2 just extends another year. So the fourth annual report on ESSER 2 will cover September 1 of 23 through August 31 of 24. So four years annual report. We've already done the first year of ESSER 1. So there's three years remaining for ESSER 1. There is four full years on ESSER 2. And ESSER 3, because of when it was allocated, ends up with five years of reporting. This year's report from 9-1-20 to August 31-21 will again be the first annual report for ESSER 3. And then the second, third, and fourth annual reports, you'll be reporting with the other programs. And then on the fifth annual report year, 9-1-24 through 8-31-25, uh, it will just be ESSER 3. So this is gonna be a rather large data collection this year and the next two years, because you're gonna be reporting on all three of the ESSER grants. In that fourth year, you'll be reporting ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 only, ESSER 1 will have dropped off, and then the fifth year will be only ESSER 3. So this data collection is an ongoing annual collection. Uh, we know that some of it looks different and you may not have been tracking some of your activities in your records exactly the way this report asked them. USDE has been working on this report for a year. They have changed the data elements. They've collected, uh, put it out and collected public comment, made more changes, put it out again. So there have been a lot of changes. We don't know exactly what the final, final version of this report may look like yet. We have a pretty good idea at this point, and that's why we're sharing this information with you, because you are gonna have a short timeline on this current year report. So we're gonna open this report form March 1st. We'll give you about 10 days and then we'll do a live Q&A session with you to answer questions for you on March 11th. And the report will be due back to TEA on April 1st. Some point after that, we will have to report all your data to USDE. And we don't know that date yet. That's one of the things that they haven't finalized and told us when the state's report will be due to USDE. All we know is they expect it will be early May. So this time period from April 1st, when all your reports are due to us, and when we have to report sometime early in May, we will be having to do data checks, data validations, cleaning up data, getting people that didn't submit on time to get their data submitted. All that will be done in a matter of about one month. Now, the very right-hand item on this timeline is actually important to you because once we submit the data, USD will do their own set of data checks, may ask for corrections, but then they are going to post every school district's data on their website. So in a minute, you're gonna see there's still some narrative questions that you have to respond to. And you want to have someone review those responses. Because if you could put misspelled words or grammatically incorrect responses, it's going to eventually end up on USD's website. So you need to be aware that all this data you're reporting does have to be accurate. You have to be able to have the, uh, be maintaining the documentation locally for it. But no, it will be publicly reported on USD's website. Now, next year's report hopefully will be a slightly different timeline. 
And what we're expecting is that the data elements are not going to change so that we will know what you're reporting in the re annual report next year. And we'll be able to develop a timeline that works better for you in the districts and charters rather than having such a compressed timeline that you're working under this year. And we do have to actually say USD gave us some flexibility. Their initial plan they sent out last fall is this report would have been due to them in February. So they have at least pushed the timeline back a little bit uh, to give us about three more months since they haven't finalized all the details of the reporting form itself. But this first year is gonna be a very quick turnaround. We understand that you may not have the data all lined out the way it's asked for. You're gonna to have to get that in place. Short timeline the first year, subsequent years, the timeline will be better. So I mentioned there are narratives. Uh, you'll remember if you uh, went to any of our sessions, when they first put this information out, they were initially asking five or six narrative questions. Uh, through the public comment period, we commented on requesting no narratives. Lots of people requested to get rid of the narratives. They at least cut it down to two questions. But there are two questions around your 20% set aside requirement that you will be providing a narrative response. And this is where I'm talking about, you want somebody to look at this because it's gonna be posted publicly. So the, you're gonna to have to write two narrative responses. Uh, the first one is 3D3, describing which activities or interventions that you implemented to satisfy the mandatory set aside requirement, which respond to students' academic, social, emotional needs, addressing the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on your underserved student groups. Second narrative, is to describe the selected activities and interventions that address that disproportionate impact for each of those student groups, including uh, the major racial and ethnic groups, children from low-income families, children with uh, disabilities, English learners, migrant students, students experience homelessness, foster care, other groups that have been uh, impacted by the pandemic that were identified by the state. And so we had to address all of these different student groups in the state's plan. And so first question is, what's different about these two? You have to really look uh, for the detail. The first one is you're describing the activity. The second one is you're describing how those activities addressed the impact. So you have to really pay attention to the wording on these two narratives, because at first glance, they look like they could be asking the same thing. D3, uh, 3D3 is actually more of a listing of those types of activities. 3D4 is how those activities you, uh, that you actually implemented actually did address that disproportionate impact on your student groups. 3,000 character limit. That's not huge but that still is a pretty decent amount of space to provide your narrative. Uh, system is not gonna accept more than 3000 characters. Our system will be also programmed to keep you within that limitation so that when you submit it to us, it is within the requirements. But just keep in mind, you do have these two narrative questions, but at least it's not five or six narratives they started with. There are definitions that are going to be relative to this reporting. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all these. I'm gonna hit certain ones. Uh, as you look through the data elements, you will realize why these definitions are important. Awarded, the federal definition is when the state awards funds, when it makes the subgrant. Awarded means you have a no-go. When we issue a NOGA to you for your grant funds, we have awarded those funds to you. So I'm not gonna go through CARES Act, CRISA, SR1, SR2. Evidence-based. There are one or two of your data elements that are talking about evidence-based programs that you're implementing. And it's primarily, I think it's in the after-school area where you're gonna see this the most. 
uh, but there are a couple of the data elements that do ask for evidence-based activities. Uh, it is the same definition of evidence-based that is in ESA. So the ESEA definition that's been there for several years is the same definition they're working with for evidence-based. Uh, and you can read the definition there, but it's also gonna be in all the material for you. So this is gonna be an important uh, definition for you. Some of your activities may or may not meet the definition of evidence-based. So you have to be aware of that when you're reporting on those particular data elements. Uh, expended, you know, it's kind of funny sometimes that we have to have a definition for what expending money actually means, uh, but there is a definition for people. Um, full service community school may or may not. That's an example of uh, uh, one type of allowable activity. It may or may not impact you in your reporting. Plan uses of the funds. This is the remaining funds that have been earmarked and budgeted for a purpose. They're considered planned uses. If they are in your use of funds plan or your return to in-person instruction plan under ESSER 3, those are obviously planned uses of the funds. Uh, but there is a couple of data elements where that they're talking about planned use of remaining funds. Qualified educator. Uh, this definition is slightly different than what you would may want to use for different types of teacher certification and permits that are allowed. So for this reporting document, qualified educator means that the educator has met all the requirements to earn state certification in the area they are assigned to teach. It does not include substitutes and it does not include provisional licenses or certifications. So there are some of the teacher permits that may be um, issued for a short-term basis that will not necessarily meet this definition of qualified educator. Uh, we're actually going to work with our certification department and try to kind of come up with a list for you to make it a little easier for you that if you've got a teacher on this permit, they qualify as a qualified educator for this report. If they're on this type of emergency or temporary permit, they do not. Uh, so we're gonna be working on that uh, to get that information available to you to help you with that. Uh, and we'll have that posted before this report goes live March 1st. Uh, and then there's questions about remaining funds. And so all these things are defined with the reports from the USDE. You have to report based on these definitions, even though something like qualified educator is a little different than what we consider qualified. There is a little difference there. Uh, your reporting does have to follow these definitions. That is for consistency across states because there will be lots of research reports, uh, articles, all kinds of information that will use this information that is reported by every district and therefore every state. So it's for consistency. So at this point, uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, Natalie and Adrian are going to, uh, one of them will share their screen. They're gonna walk you through, show you the actual data reporting form. Uh, I will tell you it is not totally finalized. It is pretty close. It's what we expect you're going to be reporting to us. But going back to the second slide, there's always things that can change as we get clarification from USDE. So we are going to uh, move into that section and I'm gonna turn it over to Natalie. Thanks, Corey. Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through the form. Um, for purposes of this demonstration, we're using the ESSER 1 report form. We'll have three separate uh, report forms, um, ESSER 1, ESSER 2, and ESSER 3. So at the top of the form, you would uh, select 
your LEA name through the drop down. And if it's not um, available in the drop down, then you would enter it, enter your information. Next, you would go down to uh, the individual completing this form, you would enter your name and the, your email address. And then you would start the form. So section three, uh, mandatory subgrants to LEAs, this is basically use of funds, how you've used those funds to address different categories. So the first category is addressing physical health and safety. And there are several um, uh, boxes that you would need to fill in if they apply. So personnel services, uh, salaries, uh, personnel sa uh, services benefits, uh, 3B1C is purchased professional and technical services, 3B1D purchase property services, um, then there's other purchase services, supplies, property, uh, debt service and miscellaneous, and other items. The next section uh, covers uh, meeting students' academic, social, emotional, and other needs, excluding mental health supports. So the categories um, under uh, this section would be um, personal services, salaries that you spent in that area in meeting students' academic, social, emotional, and other needs, uh, personnel services benefits, uh, purchased professional and technical services, purchase property services, other purchase services, supplies, property, debt service and miscellaneous, other items. Next section, mental health supports for students and staff includes some of the same categories, personal services, salaries, personnel services, uh, benefits, purchased professional and technical services, purchased property services, other purchase services, supplies, property, uh, debt service and miscellaneous and other items. And so the uh, next category would have the similar um, um, entries uh, under operational cont continuity and other allowed uses personal services, property, other items. The next section, 3B3, is planned uses of remaining ESSER 1 funds. So these are gonna be percentages. 3B3A, uh, the percent of remaining funds planned for addressing physical health and safety. Uh, remaining funds planned for meeting students' academic, social, emotional, and other needs. And these are those categories that were listed above that, where you entered the uh, expenditures that you've already made. Uh, remaining funds planned for mental health su supports for students and staff. Uh, remaining funds planned for operational continuity and other uses. Uh, and remaining funds not yet planned for specific use. And again, these are percentages. Uh, section 3B6, maintaining safe in-person instruction. Did the LEA expend ESSER funds on any of the items below in the current reporting period? Note, ESSER refers to ESSER 1, 2, and 3, or ARP ESSER funds, and includes both mandatory subgrants and SEA reserve subgrants. And these are yes or no questions. So. Um, did you spend any funds promoting any ESSER funds? One, two, or three. Promoting vaccination, consistent and correct mask use, physical distancing, screening testing to promptly identify cases, clusters, and outbreaks, ventilation, hand washing and respiratory etiquette, staying home when sick and getting tested, contact tracing, and cleaning and disinfection. 3B7, ESSER funds to provide internet access. 
did this LEA use ESSER to provide home internet access for any students in the current reporting period? And ESSER refers to all three, ESSER one, two, and three. So this is one of those um, questions that's clustered together and includes both mandatory subgrants and SEA reserve subgrants. Mobile hotspots with paid uh, data plans. And these are yes or no questions. Internet connected devices with paid data plans. Uh, district pays for the cost of home internet subscription for student. Uh, district provides home internet access through a district managed wireless network or other. 3B8, re-engaging students. Oh. Um, Adrian's pointing out to me that 3B7E, if you have other, you have to enter narrative and you have to specify. So we don't consider this to be the 3000 character um, narrative. This would just be um, something that is not mentioned above. 3B8, re-engaging students. Do the LEA seek to re-engage students with poor attendance or participation? Mark yes or no. 3B10, the total amount expended for these staff, and these are very specific, indicate the total number of these specific positions supported with any of the ESSER funds, so that's ESSER 1, 2, and 3, for the following positions for the reporting period. Support indicates salaries and or benefits uh, or partially or fully paid with ESSER funds. Special educators and related service personnel, paraprofessionals, bilingual or English as a second language educators, school counselors, school, school psychologists and or social workers, nurses, short-term short contractors, classroom educators not covered by previous categories, support personnel not covered by previous categories, administrative staff not covered by previous categories. Subsection C, allocation of ESSER resources within the LEA. Did this LEA allocate some portion of ESSER funds to schools in this reporting period? If yes, then there are uh, additional questions that you would answer under that. If no, then you would just move on to subsection D, but let's look at some of those questions if you answer yes. How did this LEA allocate ESSER funds? Mark yes or no, so these are yes or no questions, to indicate whether the uh, below criteria were used to allocate ESSER funds to schools. For example, if the LEA allocated funds using a weighted formula of total number of enrollments and a total number of enrolled students with disabilities, the LEA should mark yes to rows A and B below. Number or proportion of students at the school who are eligible for free or reduced price lunch and or other indicators of low income background, measure of lost instructional time, learning loss, stakeholder or community input, Title I status, other data. Here's another um, narrative question if you answer other data. So we don't think that we'll get a lot of um, people using this particular box. So we don't expect this to be um, a reporting burden for LEAs because the uh, selections above cover most LEA responses. Subsection D, um, for our SR3, there'll be um, the reserve to address impact of learning loss. So in this box, 3D1, the total amount reserved by the LEA to address the impact of learning loss this value must be at least 20% of the value reported in 3A for our Besser. So 3A will be pre-populated. It will be the grant award amount 
uh, by TEA. So that would be pre-populated. And then the total expenditures of ARP SR LEA reserve in this reporting period. So that would be the um, amount that you spent from the 20% during this reporting period. D3D3, three, three, uh, which activities or interventions did the LEA implement uh, to satisfy the LEA's mandatory set aside requirements of ARP SR funds? Did the LEA implement summer learning or summer enrichment, after school programs, extended instructional time, tutoring, additional classroom teachers, other additional staffing, uh, and our activities to assess and support social emotional, other ad additional staffing and our activities to assess and support mental health needs, uh, 3D3H, um, other additional staffing and our activities to identify and or respond to unique student needs, universal screening, academic assessments, and interve intervention data systems, such as early warning systems, improve coordination of services for students with multiple types of needs, such as full uh, service community schools or improved coordination with partner agencies such as foster care services, early childhood programs, curriculum adoption and learning materials, core staff uh, capacity building training to increase instructional quality and other. This is another one of those um, narrative boxes that we don't consider uh, many LEAs completing because of, of all the coverage of the different areas in the um, items above it. And then here's the um, narrative question that Corey was referring to. Please describe how the selected activities or interventions address the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on each listed underserved student groups, including each major racial and ethnic group. And there's a 3,000 character limit. Um, subsection B, uh, activities by subpopulations. How did this LEA use ESSER, and this is one of those combo questions, um, funds to support learning recovery or acceleration for student groups who were disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic? And the 4B11, there's, um, these are yes or no, evidence-based summer learning or summer enrichment programs, evidence-based, oh, sorry. So if you answer yes to that, is this program available to all students? Yes. Um, indicate the number of students this program serves at full capacity. And we're going to get as soon as the USDE uh, help desk opens, we're going to get a definition for full capacity. Uh, and then total unique headcount of students that participated in this activity. Um, Natalie, can yes. you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly point out, so each of these, one, two, three, four, they all do essentially the same thing. Yes just ahead of time. So you, if you select yes, there's a whole lot more information to um, fill in. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so on evidence-based um, summer, let's see, come back up. Okay, evidence-based summer learning, we've answered yes. And so here's what we have to enter after that. Is this program available to all students? Indicate the number of students this program serves at full capacity. And like I said, we're gonna get um, a definition from USDE for full what full capacity means. Uh, total unique headcount of students that participate in this activity. Um, and then indicate the number of eligible students within each of the following student groups and the number of eligible students from that student group that participate in this activity. Uh, eligible students refers to students within the student group who meet eligibility criteria for participation, such as belonging to the appropriate grade for the activity. 
So students with one or more disabilities, you would enter the number, enrolled eligible students at LEA in the subgroup, students with one or more disabilities, uh, eligible students in subgroup participating, uh, low-income students uh, would be the number of enrolled eligible students at the LEA in the subgroup, and then um, the low-income students, the number of eligible students in subgroup participating. And then you would do that for English learners, foster care, uh, migratory students, and students uh, experiencing homelessness, uh, American Indian, Alaska Native, Asian, Pacific Islander, Hispanic, Black non-Hispanic, white non-Hispanic, and other student um, subpopulation. Um, again, that would be a narrative, but we expect that the majority of the groups are gonna be covered above. So that would just be a short answer. Uh, there's evidence-based after-school programs. If you check yes, we do a similar, um, we do similar questions uh, for each one of those. Extended instructional time, uh, including extended school day or school week or school year. Uh, evidence-based high dosage tutoring. Early childhood education program expansion or enhancement full service community schools. And if you answered yes, again. Yeah, answer. this is the only one that's different of okay. the other seven. Okay, so for this one, uh, how many new or additional full service community schools were launched using these funds in the LEA? Uh, how many current uh, full service community schools received additional services and are support using these funds? And what is the total enrollment in full service community schools supported with ESSER funds within this LEA? Did the LEA purchase uh, educational technology? And then whether or not it was purchased for all students and then the number of students in each um, subgroup and uh, the number in the subgroup participating. Okay, so 4B2 is the total LEA student enrollment by demographic subgroup. Here you're gonna indicate um, how many students are enrolled at the LEA in the particular subgroups. And then we have the students with one or more disabilities, low-income students, English learners, uh, students in foster care, migratory students, those same categories. And then there's the total unique headcount of enrolled students. And the total unique headcount does not equal to the sum of the rows, does not have to equal to the sum of the rows because some students are gonna be counted in multiple rows. Subsection C, access to select staff, uh, school year 2020 through 2021. 4C1, please provide the count of FTE staff assigned to serve each school in this LEA, regardless of the funding source, as of September 30th, 2020. For example, if one full-time nurse is shared equally by five schools within an LEA, allocate 0.2 FTE to each school served. These data would, will be merged with school membership data to calculate staff to student ratios for the 2020-21 school year. And it only applies to these groups, uh, special educators and related service personnel, including paraprofessionals, bilingual educators or English as a second language educators, school counselors, social workers or school psychologists and nurses. And that would be the end of this report form. And then you would just certify uh, and include the name and the title of the authorized official. And then um, there's a checkbox that says, send me a copy of my responses. Make sure you check that uh, and put your email address. 
and you can only put one email address, but you can always uh, forward it uh, once you get the email. And then you would hit submit. Now, are there any questions? I think um, Matt was going to. Nellie, we've we've collected them. I'm just going to pause here and have folks um, check the Q&A and vote up. I think um, we're kind of clearing out the comments versus questions as we go. So um, if Adrian can just kind of have the report um, kind of ready when we need to hop to it, we'll try to we'll try to go to slide and structure questions and then report questions after we wrap up. But I think um, I think we can kind of move to the next few um, slides and kind of open Q&A and we'll try to handle the reporting period and things first. So Adrian, if you just want to keep this live, Corey will come back on and we'll we'll go from there and try to tackle them all at once because we'll have plenty of time to go through Q&A. Okay. All right. Um, while you're voting up the questions, you want to make sure that we can answer for you today. Um, do you want to reiterate? We understand it's a lot. It's detailed. You may not have been tracking the data exactly the way it is. And we understand spring break happens for most of you guys during your reporting window. We can't do anything about the timeline this year. Uh, we have commented to USD, we have spoken with them individually about how rushed this is going to be. The timeline is being set at the federal level. The only thing we can do is put the data collection out there, get the information out to you as early as possible. That's why we're sharing this information today. And by Friday, you'll have a recording, you'll have a PDF of what the form looks like where you can start working toward a data collection. If we get the data collection finalized, we'll release it before March 1. But March 1 should be your expectation with a April 1, 22 due date. That gives us the same 30 days. We have to go through a lot of checks to get this information ready to be submitted to USDE. So I can't give you more time than what we're already giving. It's a lot, we know it. We did not write this report. Believe me, if we wrote this report, it'd be a whole lot shorter. But this is what's required by the federal agency. The state agreed to submit this report when we accepted the money on your behalf. Districts and charter schools agreed to report as required by TEA and USDE when you accepted the grant funds. I get it that you didn't know what this report was gonna look like, but we didn't either. So we all have to just make the best of this and do the best we can and get this report done. So we're gonna start the questions. Uh, first question at the top, I'm gonna go ahead and cover it and then Matt's gonna start pretty much moderating through these. You spend all your SR1 or SR2 money during the fiscal year, do you have to still keep reporting? Yes. If you spent any money during the year of the report, this first report is October 1 of 20 through uh, August 31 of 21. Any money for that grant spent during that reporting year is reported. Right now, even if you spent all of your ESSER 1 money prior to the start of this year, we still have to have a report from you, but you're going to submit a zero report. Later, that might change. We might be able to let you somehow designate uh, the SR1, you've already submitted your final report. But right now, even if you spent no money for the grant in the reporting year, you will have to submit a report with zeros in it because we have to track a report from you. Some people have questioned why does the ESSER 3 report start so early? Because we did have ESSER 3 money out in the districts being spent during the reporting year. It may not be your district. Your Minoga may have come later and maybe you didn't spend any ESSER 3 money in this first reporting year. You have to submit a $0 report. 
if that is changed, if USD becomes more flexible, where we, there's some way we can change that, we will and we'll get that information out to you. But right now, everyone must submit a report for every grant, even if you're reporting zero dollars expended in the reporting year. All right, Matt, let's go see how many questions we can get through. Well, I want to talk about the reporting piece I mentioned, Corey, and you already stated the dates, but the only thing that really opens March 1st is your electronic submission. When we, sub when we send and provide you the data elements, this report is for activities that have occurred through August of last year. So there is no wait. Once you receive the data elements, we will have tools for you to collect this. So I'm going to clear out a couple of these questions, kind of adding to it. The submission window in um, that is coming up in March and opening and having this training today accounts for spring break as best we can. You have or will have the ability to collect all of the data for the reports prior to this in March opening. We will be working through submission issues and data with school. So I don't, not to do double speak, but the report window is open and the date ended August of last year with three reports. So a lot of these answers will be nuanced to when you use the funds, but we had some folks asking to show the timelines again. We are in for CARES ESSER 1. This is your second annual report. So some asked if we spent all the funds. That grant was March 2020, and this report window is October. So it's likely you will report even if you spent funds because of that time frame. We will be in the first annual report for ESSER 2 and 3, but again, all of these activities for these reporting windows finished August 31st of 21 for the state fiscal year. You, you are under no obligation to wait, nor do we encourage you to wait. We will have usable tools for you to collect this data to be prepared. When the window opens in March, you will be putting that into the electronic form. We're using the time now to finalize the form to make it as seamless as possible. Uh, that's why we're providing the training now and we didn't postpone this. So not to say this is actually more fun than you think it is, it is not, but the window is open now through activities of August of last year. So you will have information this week and you can begin to collect this. So the spring break and the reporting window will not be overly burdensome. There will be nothing stopping you from preparing for this and having it submitted before spring break once you receive the information. We're going to go to Q&A. That's going to clear a few of these out. Um, also want to let folks know you can still vote them up. Um, we will show you the FAQ submission form towards the end, but uh, we will be gathering these questions, um, aggregating them, and putting more report guidance out for our FAQ process. So, Corey, I'm going to clear out a few of these on timeline. Um, want to point out in a few other cases uh, the documents talk that we will post will give you all of these fields to collect this information and we'll talk about report due dates. But again, all three grants will be for activities through August 31st of last year. The second, third, and fourth reports are just giving you an idea of the dates that will be coming in the subsequent rounds. So yes, we will, um, we will create forms that you can use to collect this data and share those with you along with the reporting. Um, going through a few of these others, should narrative questions be answered based on the expenditures? All answers should be based on the specific reporting period and those expenditures, whether it's the narrative or the, um, or the yes, no questions. Always answer based off that specific grant and that specific reporting period. Will there be any exemplars that TA could share for narrative? Um, likely no, depending on when schools submit. Um, Narrative is new in this report. We will be doing um, data uh, cleaning because the way this report works, the federal government gives us the expenditure data you're reporting against, and we collect narrative from you. So we will not we will not necessarily be sharing good answers for what LEAs did with their funds. We will work with our ESC technical assistance providers and teams to provide guidance, but um, you will need to assume as an LEA what you provide a narrative could be what is published public publicly posted by USDE as you as you wrote it with over um, over a thousand grants we will we will not be correcting those 
um, as closely as it will be the financial data. So you will want to take time to draft and prepare those um, moving forward. Corey, I'm gonna ask you to chime in after answering this, but we have a couple of questions about uh, hold harmless and offset. Um, the activities should still be reported in, in the appropriate columns, whether there was hold harmless or uh, for ESSER 1 or ESSER 2. So if those funds were used for any activity, you could certainly make a note in, a, in an area. But Corey, anything you want to add about ESSER 1 and 2 portions that were used for hold harmless? No, you're exactly correct. They're still reported by the correct category and activity, uh, even if it was supplanted uh, or part of the set aside for hold harmless, you still report everything the same. We're going to have some good definition questions here. Um, I want to start before I get into some of these by saying we are giving you the definitions and the terminology given to us by the federal government. So we don't expect that you necessarily agree with their terminology when they talk about subgroups versus student groups, but we're not changing the guidance from the report so that it is as clear as possible. So we, when the, when the help desk opens, as Natalie mentioned, we can get some more clarification on mental health supports and how that doesn't fall in social emotional, but we, we took no liberties in changing any of the terminology from the federal government to this point. So if there's a clarification question we need answered, we want that put through our FAQ process on our ESSER page and we will make good use of that help desk. So um, this will answer it. some questions I saw later in the Q&A, but subgroup is a, is a federal term they selected. Um, we, we didn't choose the terminology for this report. So there may be other more appropriate terms, um, but these, these were given to us by the federal government. Um, these three reports will be, uh, will be done separately because of the amount of data. So you will uh, receive a template and tool and then subsequently an online form, and you will be collecting this in three separate reports. So there's three submissions with much of the information, um, the questions and the like being the same. What about districts of innovation that don't require certification in certain areas? Are these teachers considered qualified? Corey, I think you spoke to this a bit, but for the purposes of this report, we take a pretty broad understanding of qualified educator. Is that correct? Right. Uh, district of innovation, the teachers have met, because you have district of innovation status, the teacher is meeting the requirements for your district. So in a district of innovation, you're gonna have a broader set of, re, of uh, definite, a broader definition of what set of teachers are qualified educators than someone who is not a district of innovation. They then will have to go by the definition and the state rules. And, and we'll address that when we put it, that document out, trying to help you with guidance on how to define qualified educator and what's not qualified by the different types of permits and things. But a district of innovation, they are considered qualified by your status as, as approved as a district of innovation. Great. How are the reports accessed? Um, again, we will be putting out um, Word or PDF tools for you to begin gathering your data. You will receive either a general or LEA specific link in a Smartsheet form to do that. This is not going to be connected through the, the ER system. Um, this will come from our program office, uh, led by um, Natalie Coffey and, um, and that team. So there are specific links. These are separate collections given the timeline and nature of this. So you will use the tools we provide this week, um, kind of as your note taking and data gathering. And then there will be a, a link that is provided uh, for you to fill out for each of these three. So you won't see this in the expenditure reporting system. Good question. It was indicated uh, that this was SR1 report, but had 20% set aside. So just to be clear that the federal uh, report combined much of the three grants in one document, we will be breaking that out into three reports. So 20% set aside still only applies to SR3. Um, and that may be one difference you see in the SR1 report. Uh, today's report walkthrough is to give you um, kind of a sample preview of what the form might look like. Uh, but there is no 20% set aside um, other than what there was in S or three, and it will be specific to that grant. But there will be some of those combo questions that we're unpacking a little bit that Natalie alluded to because of the way the federal government did the reporting. We have a lot of questions about P 
PEAMS is the number of eligible students based on districts fall PEAM submission. And then we had some, some other sentiment and comments about why do we report this if we already do PEAMS. Um, we are again giving you the questions required at your LEA level um, from the federal report. So Corey, I don't recall if we had specific guidance on which, which one um, to account for in student counts or they could use their PEAMS data. Um, I don't know if we had any any specifics there yet or if we're gonna put out guidance on which PEAMS numbers to use. I don't know if you had anything to add there. I will have to put out guidance because some of the data is going to be uh, crossed with existing enrollment data. Um, it's probably gonna to need to be the PEAMS count, but we'll we'll verify that and get additional guidance out for you. Next question talks about the district did seek to re-engage students with poor attendance, but they were not gonna expend ESSER funds. So do you mark yes or no? These reports are specific to how the ESSER money was expended. So if you did re-engaging students, but you did it locally, you're gonna mark no on the ESSER report because you did not spend ESSER money. Same way you're gonna, when you're comparing your ESSER one, two and three report for the same year, you may have spent S or two money on a particular report. So that's where you're gonna report it. And it may be no in S or one and S or three. So these reports are specific to how the S or money, the individual S or grants were expended. Uh, so putting no doesn't hurt you. It really doesn't. Uh, it's just how did you spend this particular pot of money? Next question, when completing the report, is it possible to save your progress? The submission um, is one is one stream, so it doesn't it doesn't save progress. That's why we're going to be providing the tools for you to collect the data. Once we have a submission, um, as early as March 1st, when we receive submissions, we will be reviewing uh, data for consistency and errors and doing our best to reach out to school. So that whole reporting window, we're not we're not waiting till it closes April first. We will be reaching out to schools that submit, but that those reports, each of the three, uh, you will want to use the kind of the tools and the the resources we provide to gather that data. But it it is one submission as you go through, and then we will reach back out through that same system if there are changes or corrections. Um, currently, that's the that's the look. If we're able to get progress um, save or any other features completed then we would certainly let you know where does esther supplemental fit into this timeline corey there are schools that received esther supplemental with federal funding how does that fit esther supplemental and t class are both funded out of state level activity money so we will report everything on esther supplemental in t class because that is our state activity money that funded those grants. It's a different section of the report to USDE. So we do not expect the LEA to have to do any of this type reporting on ESSER supplemental or T-class because we think we have all the data we need because the state level activity money is reported separately. And we just gave those grants out of that funding. So we should have everything we need on those two grants. Clearing out a few more, we will provide guidance on, on qualified educators. So we do have some questions about adding instruction blurbs. We're still working on the form. We will provide guidance on each piece of this through other um, Word or PDF documents and other guidance through FAQ, but the, the online form itself will likely be limited in how much text we put in to provide you with responses, but we will try to link to guidance and answers and we will um we will provide everything we can but it won't always be able to be shared you can see they're already pretty lengthy forms because of all of the federal language and guidance so expect those to be provided and at the end today we'll show you the ESSER page and we will we will post guidance and communicate it through there as well um, we also anticipate that we haven't scheduled yet um, potential QA sessions um, on this and we'll be working with our um, ESC technical assistance teams for ESSER as well. So those will be developed. Um, we got some questions about fall PEMS. We'll have more specific guidance on that. Um, 
Natalie, I just want to be clear. This this is a question about the narrative. Is there a 3,000 character limit for both questions one or two? We only have one question for each LEA with a 3,000 character limit, correct? correct? The other text boxes are other spaces if you need to add any clarifying language, right? Correct. Yeah, part of that is probably from my slides earlier. Uh, guys, I just saw these slides last night for the first time. I saw the form for the first time, same time you were seeing it in the demo. Staff were able to go back into 3B3 and put all those checkbox options instead of a narrative. So you only have one true narrative and that's where the 3000 character limit is. I probably caused that confusion. Oh, the feds did. That's that's what we're gonna say. I just wanna point out, yes. uh, there's gonna be there's gonna be some questions here. This, these, most of this, and part of why we're doing this training now is not totally finalized by the federal government. So Natalie mentioned there's some questions being added. They go through comment processes. So um, this is a much later report date they extended and we're trying to stay ahead of that. So anything we've been able to finalize and be very clear about, we've tried to be careful so that you don't collect data you don't need. Um, but this is still ever changing, unfortunately, in some areas, but most of this LEA information, we have not seen significant change. And that's why we're doing this. So um, again, you will wanna be sure you're on the, the listserv connected to your ESC ESSER support so that you get any, um, any updates or guidance. We, we often receive announcements from federal government on this. We did not even expect and communicate those, but um, happens often. Authorized, uh, next question, the authorized person is typically a superintendent. If we are not authorized, how do we get this report to that person? Um, let be open to Corey correcting me um, while he's, I think um, people are admiring his, his background. Um, we, we, for reporting purposes, I think have a self-certification model for this. So the person submitting this form will be certifying they are able to submit this on behalf of the LEA. It does not necessarily require the superintendent as a grant. Uh, or other or other documents might right we have uh we have moved away from an authorized official having to submit the reports uh so we'll make an adjustment to that certification if we need to authorized official is required by federal regulation to sign drawdown request but the reporting uh you just have to be authorized by your lea to submit that report on their behalf so we can we can make adjustments to that and clarify that. Uh, form question for uh, Natalie and Adrian: Do we leave any boxes in A or blank, or is there a zero required? Zero. Yes, you would have to um, have zero. You couldn't leave it in A or blank. And what it's pre-populated with zero, so mm -hmm. if you have nothing to put in, you just skip it. Yeah, most of that aligns to the federal requirement that we provide some type of data in that field, even if it's a, even if it's a no, it was another fun thing we learned last year. <laughs> um, this one gets Natalie a little bit into subsection C, but spending ESSER funds at the district level and not allocating to individual schools means subsection C would be a no, correct? Let me give you some time to kind of go to that. Uh, it, as well. It's not required. If you didn't give any funds to your to other LEAs within yeah. your district. Yes, sir. So you're saying, first. yeah, so you're, you're correct. Okay. Yeah. Again, this is um this is based off federal. So we um we've tried to build a form that kind of skips some of that and the yes nos. Um, so that would not apply if you didn't. And you'll see this in the tools that that um and the kind of word doc we provide, so you can begin collecting this. SR3 first year doesn't start till 10 120, right? Yeah. So the the reporting guidance um, that was in the slides uh, is is federally based, but it's written that way because of the variation in state fiscal year. So again, we'll just say SR1 is October 1st, 20 to August 31st, 21. That's the second SR1 report you have done, the second annual report. ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 would be the start of the, of the state fiscal year, which would be September. So after ESSER 1, you're in a full state fiscal year. It's only ESSER 1, and you'll see this in the, in the slides and in the um, documents where that October 1st, 20 date is. 
And Matt, that's because we collected up to September right. 30th with the first report. Right. The first report had that that went all the way back to March and it was kind of a, a very different timeline. So and you'll see this in the in the tool. Um, it's where we took a lot of the information from the slides that will line out the reporting period. So. How are special educators in subsection B of the report define special ed or interventionist? I think if we don't have a clear definition right now, we will put that through to the help desk. And I'm not, I'm looking back at our definitions and I'm not sure that they gave us full definition of, of special ed. So we'll, we'll track that question for, to make sure we have a full definition and provide guidance on that. Basically special ed services Special ed and special ed services are those that are identified in the student's IEP. You have other interventionists who work with other student needs, and basically that's how you're going to separate those. If it's not a special ed identified student with an IEP, they are not counted as special education services most of the times. But we'll we'll clarify it. But that's your basic difference. If we do one of these for each grant. Do the sections that apply to all three have to be completed each time? Yes, because of the variation in your funds and the many different use of funds plans, um, you do a full report for each of the three. And part of that is based off the structure from the federal government on this reporting. If you have funds, this will be a little bit of a program and a reporting question. Uh, if you have funds left over in your three for a grant and you do another needs assessment and your answers change for year four, will that be an issue? Um, hard to say anything could be an issue in this, this size of reporting, but generally there are, there are subsequent reporting periods for that reason. Um, as your activities change or your needs change, you would report for that reporting period. So if there was a change within that reporting period, you might have um, for example, um, different services um, that are combined in one reporting year. If you change with remaining funds to completely different services as plans and needs changed, and you, you would report those. So anything we report to the federal government, they're likely to have questions. Um, it could be, but you still report to that reporting period um, and follow the same processes for use of funds plans or needs assessments that you would. It's not really an issue but it could be questioned as to why. So this is one of those things that you just need to make sure that you document locally. So when the feds ask us why this district totally changed course between year three and year four, we ask you, you've got it documented. You can tell us and give us the answer. It goes back to USD and that's usually the end of it. it but it could be questioned, but it's not a problem. You have a different needs assessment, you document that process and we, then you have an answer for why. Who in the district will receive the email to do the reporting? So we will either have a public link posted and send that to all of our ESSER contacts that received notice of this training and others. We will provide it to our ESC technical assistance teams. Um, and generally we try to provide this to anyone listed as primary and secondary contacts on the, um, on the actual grants. Uh, if we're able to, to make some more improvements to the report, we may have a unique link, but it would go to the same folks. So. You need to be in close con if you're not a primary or secondary contact for that grant or the the POC for your LEA, um, your school, you need to be in close contact with them. But we generally send this to the to the same contacts listed with the grant. We will also post uh, information publicly. So if someone's having uh, issues accessing the link, uh, we'll, we will put all this through our main state ESSER page. For pre-award costs, Corey, I need you to remind us of the definition ex of expenditure while I read this, but for pre-award costs, do we use the date of the original purchase or the day we drew down for those expenditures? Okay, the definition from USD for expenditure is the actual spending of the money. So you actually spent the money when you obligated it, not when you drew down the payment request because you may not have drawn down the payment request for a year.
they go on to tell you in the definition, uh, for purposes of reporting reimbursements, which may be what you're asking about, reimbursements that were made in the current reporting period that reimburse expenditures made prior to the start of the reporting period and on or after March 13, 2020 are considered expenditures for the reporting period. So in a reimbursement, it's when you obligated the ESSER three money to reimburse that during that prior expenditure during the reporting period. We have some additional questions about uh, certification. Um, and more about student counts. I want to address the one about certification because it talked about provisional. I started to talk about this during the slides, but I didn't know if I would just confuse people. This is one of the differences between Texas certification system that you can have a provisional, it's termed provisional certificate, but it is a full certified, fully licensed teacher. In the federal world, provisional means something slightly different. So a provisional certificate in the area the person is teaching, that is a qualified educator. And that's why we're going to develop this kind of side by side sheet for you to help you with that. Uh, what we're really talking about the ones that may not be meeting the federal definition of qualified educator are more the one year certificates or permits. Uh, and some of them actually probably will meet the definition, but some of them may not. So those are more the ones that might be in question, not a straight provisional certification. And that's one of the big differences between federal language and our state language. We'll do that side by side and try to clarify that for you. For student counts, are they duplicative or unique based on the groups? Natalie, I think these are numbers that they intend to be unique to add up to a total, um, even though that may not be the reality depending on the types of groups, but that may be a help desk question, but typically this type of report from, from a standpoint of student counts or funding, they typically look for numbers that are unduplicated that add up to a, to a total, whether it's the, the funding you're reporting on or the student count, correct? Yes, except for there was one question um, where you had to, you could duplicate, you could have duplicate students if they fit into different categories. And I think they usually note in a field where there's a, and they have some data points to, yes. to share where it's a duplicate or not. And you'll see that in the, yes. in the guidance documents we provide. Good question. Can this document be saved and printed prior to being submitted? Uh, right now, if you're talking about the online form, um, you could certainly save the tools, but the way it's conceived now before submission, we don't have a way once you hit the button other than doing screenshots. But again, we're, we're working to try to improve the form um, and we may have some changes before that March, uh, March 1st date, we release the online form to you. But right now, when, if you were going to print it, you would have to do it from a screenshot before you hit the button. That's why we're, we're doing the training now and providing the tool so you can gather your data. Um, earlier submissions will give you more opportunity if we see errors or have questions to resubmit or correct. So if you're working on this and at the last week of March, submit it, um, and then there are errors and issues, um, we're never sure if USDE will allow for a revision period. They have in the previous years, but we never know that. So you assume when you submit that unless TEA reaches out to you, that could be the data that we provide directly to USDE. Um, why can't TEA pre-populate student data and staff data from PEAMS? We're going to explore that, but if we start doing that now and don't tell you to be ready to collect it, you will not be prepared for March. So we will, we will see what we're able to do there with that data. We, again, still have a form that wasn't completely finalized by the federal government and wanted to give this to you now to give you all of February for data collection before we opened it. So that's part of why you're seeing this now is also to account for spring break. Um, and this timeline that requires a submission to USD by May. So um, again, follow the guidance. If we're able to do anything to re, uh, relieve the reporting burden on you, we are trying to do that. But we wanted to give you all the data elements so that you will um, be able to be compliant with this reporting requirement to the federal government. Please reiterate, if funds were spent for SR1 prior to October 2020, they will not be on this first report. That is correct.
I think I'm going to be clearing out some um, duplicates here that weren't voted. Our vote counts are getting a little bit lower. So um, while you're while you're looking at that, I'll cover a couple of these. ESSER funds were ESSER one funds were supplanted by the state. How do you report those funds? You still spent those grant funds on some activity, and so you still just report ESSER one by however you spent the federal grant funds. We understand it was supplanted, but you have to still report them for whatever activities you did spend the money on. ESSER two ends 9-30-22. By statute, yes, but SR2 has tidings, which takes it to 930 of 23. So you can still be spending your SR2 money through September 30th of 23. So that's uh, why the reporting timeline is what it is. And it's uh, another question that's a part of the reporting period where why is the report required after the end of a grant? Again, the variation in state fiscal years, um, the feds have gone out to, I think, is it three or four? Um, cycles we've talked about, but there's variation in these years. So again, that these dates may not totally align to when certain grants end or your understanding of the actual grant end date, um, kind of getting back to Corey's question that he had just answered about the, um, the tidings amendment and use of funds. Okay, so just give me, let me give you an example on ESSER 2. The money ends September 30th, 23. The third annual report ends August 31st, 23, and then there is a fourth annual report to cover all these fiscal year issues Matt just talked about that goes September 1, 23 through August 31, 24. In our fiscal year system, your fourth annual report will only cover one month, the month of September, 9-1-23 through 9-30-23. Many of you probably will already have expended your money, used all of it, and you may have nothing to report in that year. As it stands right now, you would just enter a zero report for that fourth year. Hopefully by then we will be able to find some way of putting a final report indication so that you don't have to submit a full zero report on the fourth year if you didn't have any expenditures that last month. But that's why we have to have the reporting open in, in this structure is to align to how USDE wants the reports, but also because of how our fiscal year falls. Another good question. Um, Natalie, we've got folks that do not remember the ESSER 1 report. Um, congratulations. It was, right. so, it was so much fun, <laughs> um, but someone who submitted it has left your district. Where can you check on previous reports submitted? So you can reach out um, through the ESSER page, um, and we'll probably put this in the FAQ to, um, to Natalie Coffee. but we just want to urge you when you look at the ESSER 1 report to just be sure um, that's just to retain that copy and for general awareness, you still want to focus on the current guidance for ESSER 1 and don't be, um, don't be confused by what the requirements in the first year were, what was submitted. Um, anything to add about previous ESSER 1 submissions, Natalie, for folks that don't recall it or weren't a part of it at that time? Uh, yes, the um, I have the uh, copies of the report form if they were submitted uh, from Qualtrics, and I can send a copy to um, anyone who emails me and asks for a copy of that report. Um, USDE already has that information uh, posted um, on their um, on their webpage. Um, so if anyone wants to go look at it, we can also put that link. Uh, yeah. on our on our web page yeah, we'll provide that as well uh, this one gets specific to section four um, 4b1 is this question optional for our ESSER three annual performance reports years one and two so we'll have to give us one second to go back to that section Natalie, 4B, I'm not tracking 4B1. I think that was in the online form and I'm in a few other screens. Can you pull that one up, Adrian? Well, 
What was the question? So 4B1. So no. this is activities by subpopulations. Is this what? optional for ARPS or three years one and two? No, it could be applicable. Yeah. It may not be applicable to your district or charter, but it could be applicable to others. So it, no, it's 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 mm -hmm. a question that stays in there. Yeah, and this is a subpopulations question. Mm -hmm. Oh, good question. For ESSER 1, where we have private school participation, do we add private school students to our student counts? I believe those were collected for ESSER 1 in year one now, but I don't know that we have specific guidance as the help desk hasn't opened yet. Anything I'm missing there? Um, count of private school students, which would just be in uh, ESSER 1. Natalie may be on mute. I think we're going to have to get clarification from yeah. USD because nothing in the data elements talks about those private school equitable services. And that may be an oversight on their part. And we, we may not want to bring that up to them. <laughs> uh, nope. But nothing in there. And Natalie, you're back. But I don't remember seeing anything about private school equitable services in this data report. No. Yeah. Just in uh, ESSER 1, in year one. Yeah, so just in the one that was reported last year. So mm -hmm. we'll, we'll have to do some checking on that. Same, is this the same form? Generally, yes, it will be, but you'll see in the tools there will be variation in your answers for each grant, but we're trying to keep it pretty streamlined. Um, and so again, that's why we'll have a separate form for each so that you don't have to aggregate and submit because there are differences in the three grant programs. I think we still have some need for clarity on expenditures. Again, Corey, I know you addressed this, but now in terms of drawdown, would you only report on what you have drawn down or is it regardless of drawing down the funds from the ER system? We're going to get clarification and put out a very simplified definition of that. I can tell by the continuous questions on it that mm -hmm. we need to get some really detailed clarification for you. We'll do the same with this question about uh, payroll accruals as well and put those in FAQ for additional guidance again once the help desk opens. I think we're running through some. Will the report information be on the web from USD by LEA or by the whole state? Natalie, from ESSER 1 last year, it's LEA level publicly shared, correct? That's correct. Yeah. All of our submission, ends up, including our state level reserve, ends up being published. So when we provide this information, we're doing a, a submission to USD that um, puts together all of your LEAs. And that data usually comes in based off your um, your school's um, identifying numbers, uh, the DUNS number, and then a dollar amount, but it is at LEA level. All of these reports for the first, uh, for this second round, um, run through August 31st, 21. Correct, Natalie, that's that's what the, the close date for all three is with ESSER 1 accounting for October 1st. Yes. Yeah, and you'll see those in the in the timelines as well. Uh, this is a general question, but I think you get the gist of it. So are we supposed to put dollar amounts into these categories? Generally, yes. The, wherever it asks for amounts spent, um, those will be amounts that will add up to your quote unquote expended amount for each activity, wherever there's a, a data field that requires a dollar amount. That's what we spend most of our time and support doing is making sure the the fund amounts reported as you submit align to the USD overall amounts of um, of expenditures. Unless and otherwise specified, right. right, Matt, such as in this case, which it's number of students. Yeah. 
Are there other compliance reports will be required besides these? Um, there are various reports and programs. Right now, I think um, this has been the typical ESSER annual report, but a good example, while it wasn't a full report, is that um, not too long ago, um, USD required that we provided all of your links to your plan. So any, any type of requirement given the um, compliance of um, requirements of the grant, there could be other reports. We have not seen any to this state, Corey, I don't know if there's a better way to answer this. There always could be, but we haven't seen anything beyond this kind of annual report and we didn't collect this information in the application for this reason, correct? Right, we didn't know what these reports were gonna look like, so we couldn't collect this level of detail in the application. Are there any other compliance reports? You should expect there could be. Uh, right now, we know we have the state fiscal reporting we talked about Monday. We know we have this USD annual reporting. Uh, we know there will be uh, potentially other reporting requirements and we're all required to submit whatever they ask for. So I don't know of any right now, but you should just always expect with stimulus money, there could be something else coming. Next question, can we go to question 3B10, please? I'm sorry, 3B10. I think if you are monitoring chat, the FAQ submission form will be used for this as well. So, um, so 3B10, is this dollar amounts or numbers of positions? These are dollar amounts, correct? Oh, it's 3B10 a number, is number of positions. Number of positions. Total amount. So this is number of positions on 3B10. Um, again, we would use the term student group if we could. Um, these are federal terms and we're providing them to you as they were received. So you will still see subgroup or subpopulation. There's no intent behind the use of that word other than giving you the exact requirement from the federal government. Um, that's why we will, we will work on additional guidance to explain some of these terms working with the help desk. Adrian, got a question for you. Will the system allow us to put a dollar sign in the field where we're asking for expenditures without messing anything up? Um, we could put a dollar sign over here or in front, but not in the field. Okay, so we could put it to the left of the field. Mm -hmm. All right, we will try to go back through and do that just to help you be clear when it's asking for a dollar amount or when it's asking for a number. So we'll work on that as well before the final version post. And we have some chat discussion about the FAQ link. Um, Zoom chat doesn't handle URLs well. The FAQ link for submission is on the ESSER page if you're having trouble. Um, that form link has not changed. So if you're having trouble finding that through the chat, just um, go to the ESSER page. Yeah, Corey, when, I posted, we... when I posted it in chat, the, it didn't catch all of the address as the link. Yeah, it does. Uh, a couple of you have posted the full thing for us there. So look right underneath my chat and you'll see it where it is incorporated in the link. Corey, how are indirect costs reflected on a report like this? This is a question we get sometimes. Uh, there really is no place in this report for reporting indirect cost. I, I don't know that, I don't think you're gonna report indirect costs on this because there's no place for it unless we just add another question so that you can enter it so that you have a full report of everything, which we could do. If you think that will help with auditors and your internal auditors, we could add a, just one last question is the amount of indirect cost that you charge to the grant. And that way you would have a full reporting. Well, Natalie and I'll look at that and see if, see if that's an option we need to do because it doesn't fit anywhere in the existing report. Uh, there is only one area where it might, we'll have to find out is under 3B10, but it's kind of buried in there. Administrative staff not covered by previous categories, but we'll find out because as Corey pointed out, that may not, that may not fit um, generally in 3B10, that might be a place for it, but it'll, it'll also depend on the amount of the award or funds that 
again, that USD asks us to report on for you. So this could depend on actual actual drawdowns of, or the dollar amounts. So we'll get more guidance there. So if we had not expended any S or two or three funds prior to 831.21, that is a zero for this cycle. That would be correct. You're, you are reporting based off the reporting period. And then when we get more guidance on the actual expenditure. So pay close attention to those reporting dates, S or two and three. Uh, the reporting period is August 31st, 21. What portions of this report do we post on our district website? There's, there's not a requirement to post this report on your website. You may, that may be something you do. Um, I think it's certainly allowable, but this is not a part of the required postings like the use of funds or return, uh, return to school plans. Correct, Natalie? Say that again. There's no requirement to post these reports on district websites, correct? Correct. Um, will there be an update for charters? Going to need a, a little bit more on that question to be resubmitted or put through the FAQ. I'm not sure. Update for charters. We will provide guidance for everyone required to do this report. Um, but if you have a specific question, please use the FAQ link on the answer page. I think we're getting through to fewer votes, so we will get um, through a few more of these. If we kept all existing teachers, would that qualify for additional teachers um, since we're funding them with ESSER and be eliminating positions due to increased enrollment? That may be a help desk question, but generally if it's additional teachers, it would be teachers added with these funds. Um, and there will be a place in there, I believe now that we talk about um, staff retained, is that correct? I'm sorry, say that again. If we kept all existing teachers, would that qualify for additional teachers? So if we kept all existing, where, where do we account for additional teachers and elimination of positions? I'm, I'll check with the help desk on that. Yeah, I think that one's gonna depend, but generally you're also looking for maintaining or um, keeping staff versus additional or supplemental staff. Correct. How many of these questions apply to single campus districts? Um, these questions apply to any, any LEA that's a grantee. So the, um, the questions you'll have to respond to if, you, if your district or LEA received an ESSER grant. Corey, I don't know if there's any other additional guidance on that for single campus districts. And he's, Corey, you're muted. I didn't hear your question. Um answering questions for you. Oh, well, how many of these questions apply to single campus districts? All of them. Yeah. It's no, it's no, there's no difference. You still report the same way. Yeah. We will have guidance on dates for enrollment numbers. Okay, we're, we're going to go to 1045 and then close based off the questions we're seeing. So we'll go through a few more, please. Uh, if you if you want to address them now, please upvote them um, before you submit a new question, more likely to answer them. But um, I think we've got indirect costs. We're getting more guidance on that question. 4B1 eligible students in subgroup versus participating is the first number supposed to be total at full capacity. We'll, Get more guidance on that from the help desk when it opens. Make sure I don't clear any of these out that Corey's typing. Um, how do we report stipends for personnel? Again, without additional guidance, you're going to make counts under the appropriate columns, whether it's the total number of staff or funding amounts. Um, Stipends for personnel would um, likely be a count of that person where the funds were used. Um, I don't believe there's any specific 
statement about stipend reporting in the reports, Natalie, correct? Correct. Yeah, I don't think they differentiate in this case. So it would be a count. If there was a stipend for a paraprofessional and you were reporting a number, that would be one. Fun question, Corey. What is the difference between supplies and property? The difference between supplies and property is by federal definition and local policy definition. Supplies are normally under your uh, capitalization threshold and normally consumable. Property by federal definition is actually land or buildings. Uh, most people also include equipment into that definition. So equipment is anything above your capitalization threshold and must meet all the federal requirements for inventory and such. Does this include IDEA, ARP, ESSER? No, these are for your state, um, for your, your essentially formula grants in ESSERs one, two, and three. So this does not include IDEA, ARP. This is, these are your three ESSER grants for your LEA. So pre-award gets reported in the reporting period where those expenses were drawn down from the grant. That's when we're gonna get more guidance on. Um, this reporting is solely for set aside, correct? That is incorrect. This, this is a full report for any ESSER grants and any ESSER grantees for all three of ESSER one, two, and three. So this is generally going to apply to almost every LEA, um, absent those that did not um, receive or accept ESSER funds. I have some questions about accounting for FTEs funded by ESSER. Again, we will have further guidance, but typically in this report, it's a count of staff in these areas that are supported by funds. Um, I have to look back, but I don't know that we have, uh, do we have a section later on that has part-time versus full-time differentiated? I will get some more guidance on that for after school, but I believe these are the categories um, that we have and you would report accordingly. Will there be, this is a good question for Corey, will there be comparison between this report and TEA reports? Totally different purposes, totally different data elements, but yes, you should be able to see some level of alignment between this report, the state fiscal reporting and your grant approved application. There should be alignment. I should be able to pull those three documents and I should be able to see alignment with what you're reporting in the state report and the federal report. And I should be able to see alignment that you're doing things that you were approved for in your application. Next question is define full service community school. I'm gonna read the definition from the previous slide and then Corey can, can add if there's, if there's other information, but this means a full service community school means a public elementary school or secondary school that participates in a community based effort to coordinate and integrate educational developmental family health and other comprehensive services through community based organizations. Um, again, that will be the full definition from federal government will be in the slides we provide after today's training. Anything to add about full service community schools, Corey? No, you have to follow that federal definition. Uh, good question. When we get this uh, report template in Word or PDF, will we be able to see the drop downs and the yeses? Yeah, this will, the, the guidance tools we provide will show you um, in narrative form um, the drop downs, but again, it won't function as the report. So that's where the, if we provide you with a PDF or a document, again, we won't receive those, we won't review those for you. That's just for you to prepare for this report. Um, and just be sure you're following the, the yes, no, and the logic that may not be apparent in those, those documents from the federal government. Um, most important question, when you estimate you will have those tools available, we will, we will have those within the week. But again, um, submitting any of the tools other than the actual electronic submission, they will not be reviewed. Um, so we provide those to you so that you will be ahead of the March um, submission window we're providing to you. 
If you're a June fiscal year and expenses will be split between federal reports based on this, right? Yes, you have to report to the federal timeline and it, it can make it more difficult, but the, um, this is based off our state fiscal year and the dates you will see in the report. Now, one more minute we're going to do, and if my colleagues will kind of take a quick scan to see if there are any other questions that we want to cover uh, before we before we complete. If USD has questions regarding our submission, will TA be the middle person for us? Will it be the LA and USD? In this window, Natalie, we've typically reached back out to LEAs and USD does not reach out to them directly, correct? Correct, unless they're auditing them. Mm -hmm. But after our original submission, they will, um, if there are questions, they would likely come back directly to um, Corey and Natalie, and we would then reach out to the LEA whether or not they have a, a revision window or a question. So. If you have um, potential for any staff turnover changes or you have other staff involved in the collecting of this data, you want to be sure you have good communication channels, um, especially if you submit prior um, to spring break and are ahead of the ahead of the timeline here. Um, it's always good to have more than one person that can be uh, responsive, but we have a team that will work with you as best we can. I think. Um, I'm not saying any we haven't there, answered, but I'll pause. Adrian? Yeah, there's a question on question 3B6. The question states, any ESSER funds, is this question not specific to the specific grant you are reporting on? Um, Natalie and I kind of discussed this, the way the federal, the way they set up their, the way they ask the questions, they group some and then they sort some out. And so we have them all on the first ESSER one currently. And if we've already answered it on this first ESSER one form, it won't be asked again on future forms for ESSER two and three. I hope I didn't speak out of turn. No, that's correct. Yeah, we, we wanted to give you all of the questions and again, because we have to break it up in three parts. Um, we will we will do our best to not ask a duplicate question, but we're kind of working with a um, one report form in Word format, um, so we won't ask it again if we don't have to. I think I think we are about done. I just for any that ask questions that weren't voted up, we will be reviewing these and fitting in them into our FAQ process. And for those where we said we would go back for additional guidance, um, we'll do that as well. We'll reach out to USDE when the help desk opens for questions. Um, but quickly, I wanted to go to, again, for folks, the, um, the page for Esther. I think we have this on a slide, but it might be just as easy to um, to do this. So again, this is the main Nesser page. The URL has not changed. Uh, we've added more information, but this is this is your hub for all guidance. Um, all of our communications will typically link back to this, but in the TEA resources section, if you have questions uh, we did not answer or or have additional questions in the future, um, we have a regular weekly FAQ process. So the forms Corey was sharing, you would go to FAQ submission. Um, you could submit the question now under grant reporting, um, and we will be working through those questions and providing. We'll have some of these questions from today we will post, um, but if you want to submit questions, um, you want to use this form um, from the main ESSER page um, so that we're able to track questions, aggregate uh, duplicate questions and provide answers. And then on a regular basis, those are posted um, through that form after they are approved through our ESSER FAQ, which is very large now, but you can zoom in. And if you have questions that are recently answered or are newest questions, they will actually be highlighted um, green when they're new and control F and you can type keyword search. Um, 
So for any that weren't addressed today, that's that's how you want to submit those questions. Um, you can also work with your ESC technical assistance contacts if you have other other questions that aren't being addressed or may um, may not be making it to the FAQ. We have a um, a regular call with our S or ESC um, technical assistance uh, support folks who make this all possible and much less painless. Um, we wouldn't be able to do it without their help. So um, please be in communication with them as well and use the FAQ process um, rather than the grant support email to get answers to these reports. We'll be sharing more information um, by the close of this week, at least the, um, the tools and then the recording as soon as we're able. Corey, Natalie, anything to add before we close? No. You know, just to reiterate that we understand this is a brand new report. It's long, it's detailed, it's going to be time consuming, and it's going to be somewhat difficult with the timeline this first year. We understand that we're here to help you as much as we can. Uh, you know, this comes from the feds. It's just part of what we deal with when we accept federal money. Uh, but if you have questions, submit them to the FAQ at that link. Uh, other types of questions, reach out to us. Uh, staff will be available to try to help you as much as we can. And with that, we are going to take this to a close. Uh, appreciate you taking the time, appreciate you coming uh, and sitting through this and hopefully getting the information as early out to you as early as possible will be of benefit to you. Uh, reach out to us if you need help with something. Thank you all.